G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope that you are super well. Today we've got some ridiculously exciting news for the camera industry, and that is from Canon. We have the very long-awaited R1 and the successor to the R5, the R5 II, arriving on the same day. That's pretty epic. All right, let's get into a little bit of the spec of these cameras, but I also really want to talk about what it means for the industry because there's some interesting technologies in here which might not get talked about a lot, but I think they are the start of something new that's going to be a big change to our worlds, all of our worlds. It doesn't matter what brand you use moving forwards. Let's get into it. All right, let's start off with the R1 and perhaps one of the most discussed features is how many megapixels does it have? And it's coming in at 24 megapixels. Now, some had wondered if it might have been more like an A1 or a Z9, a Z8 coming in between 45 and 50 megapixels. That is not the case. This is an absolute sports and journalism powerhouse. This is an extremely fast stacked BSI sensor. It is not global. It appears to be the fastest on the market to date. Now, of course, let's keep in mind, yes, it is faster than the Z8 and the Z9 and the A1. They are all between 45 and 50 megapixels. This is only 24, so it's half the data to deal with. Great work on Canon for coming up with such a super fast sensor. And this sensor, because it's so quick, it allows for a flash sync of 1 400th of a second. That's pretty awesome in electronic shutter. It shoots at 40 frames per second raw full 14-bit files. And of course, we get full AE and AF. It also has a version of pre-capture, which can go back 20 frames, and this is either in RAW or JPEG. What about from a video perspective? Well, the R1 shoots 6K RAW internal at 60 frames per second, which strangely is exactly the same as the camera I'm shooting on here, the Z6 III. Canon are now allowing for internal RAW recording. Exactly how that's happening, I'm not 100% sure uh, whether it's compressed RAW or not. We will get into more details. This is absolutely a very first look. There is certainly a lot more information to come. Amazing video specs and amazing photography specs. If your use case fits this camera, it looks like and sounds like an absolute beast at 24 megapixels, speed, and so on. Now, some of the biggest features that are in this camera are around autofocus, and this is where I want to start to talk about the elements that I think we're going to see more and more into the future, which is less about sensors and more about AI, computer technology. And once I tell you about the R5, we're going to just talk about this more in general. This camera has a feature called registered people priority and you can record, you can teach the camera up to 10 different people's faces. It will find focus on them. That's the whole idea of it. There's probably all sorts of nuance within that that we don't know at this stage, but that's pretty amazing. So you could be, it could be in sport or it could be the wedding and you just put one person in or two people in, the bride and the groom, and the camera is always going to look for and try and focus on them first. I would have thought. And if it can't see them, then it'll just default to some sort of eye or face detect. This is really exciting technology. Two other features that are both in the R1 and the R5 is the neural network noise reduction, which what this is doing is applying noise reduction like we see in something like Topaz, but it's doing it to JPEG files in camera. And that to me is very exciting. We might have some form of high ISO image and it is going to bring noise reduction to that in camera. How far that goes, what its capabilities are, are not clear. We don't have specifications on this yet. So much more to come on how this technology works. And then another AI computational based feature of this camera is deep learning upscaling. And this of course happens in camera. And this allows your image, in the case of the R1, to go from 24 megapixels to 96 megapixels in camera. And this is upscaled. This is not using pixel shift. This is using 
computations to upscale your images. Now, to the best of my understanding, this only works with JPEG at the moment. So you go from a 24 megapixel JPEG to a 96 megapixel JPEG. But again, this is the start of something very interesting. And it's perhaps why both of these cameras are so huge. Like both of them, the, the R1 looks enormous. It, it, it really is big and I and it looks like the R5 II is uh, volumetrically somewhat bigger as well. There's a lot of heat, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of computations going on in these cameras. And of course, this is the first generation of them. And speaking of heat, uh, the R5 II, the way that Canon are trying to solve heat issues there is they've actually released a vertical grip. I suppose you're not supposed to hold on to it because where your fingers would be, that's actually the, the intake vent for this grip, which is actually a cooling grip. It screws on, it plugs in, it sucks air in and pushes it up into the camera. And obviously this is there to help the problems around overheating that we saw a fair bit when the R5 first shipped. Now the R5 II, it's got a BSI stacked sensor now. It's 45 megapixels. It does shoot 8K, 60 frames per second raw internal. That's exciting how they've done that. Well, we'll get more details on that moving forwards. Petapixel has said in regards to the speed of the R5 II sensor that it is very fast and it's great and rolling shutter when shooting electronic shutter is well suppressed but this sensor is not as fast as the sensor in the Z8. Both of these cameras now have full-sized HDMI, and as many of you would know, me and many others, that's all we want. We just want full-sized HDMI. We are not interested in the minis or the micros. They're hard to work with, they're easy to break. Both the R1 and the R5 come with 24-bit audio with up to four channels. So that's fantastic to have that level of audio, along with the registration of 10 priority people. Now, the R5 II actually comes with three grip options. There's a standard grip option with batteries in it. There is an Ethernet version, which has an Ethernet port in it. And of course, the cooling fan version that I talked about just before. Both the R1 and the R5 II have a tally lamp on the front, which is something that for those people like me and many of us who are recording and we just want to know when we're recording, it's really useful to have those sort of lamps on the front of our cameras. The R5 II and the R1 both have just the standard style flip out screen. And of course you can see whether you're recording on those screens as well, but the tally lamps tend to be bigger and brighter, especially in bright situations. That's well received. The R5 shoots at 30 frames per second raw in 45 megapixels, and it shoots at 12 frames per second with its mechanical shutter. Now, just to touch on pricing with these cameras, the R1 comes in at 6,000. 299 US dollars. It's a whopping number. In Australia, it is $10,999. And in the UK, it is £6,999. The R5 II, it comes in at $4,299 US dollars. In Australia, it is 6,999 Australian dollars. And in the UK, it is 4,499 pounds. Indeed, these cameras are not the cheapest on the market, but as usual, they are brand new. And we would, of course, expect to see these prices drop over time. But Canon are bringing new technology to the market. What we have here is we have some really interesting focus systems, which can actually learn different people's faces. At this point in time, it's up to 10 faces, and then it can just literally track that actual face. This is technology we have not seen before. Further to that, we have the AI deep learning upscaling along with computational noise reduction. All of these three capabilities are built into the camera and they're not being run by hardware, they're being run by software, which of course does run on hardware. But without the software, none of these things happen. Now, what's interesting to me, and it's something I made a video about perhaps around six months ago, is that the hardware wars are starting to come to an end from my perspective. What we're seeing here very clearly from Canon, they are not trying to push further 
with megapixels. They are sticking with the 45. I've talked a lot about it being an absolute sweet spot for 8K video. And of course, it's a lot of resolution for photography. And then if you want speed demons, which are faster, they're often faster and better in low light and so on, especially these flagship cameras, that's what we would expect, then 24 megapixels seems to be the place. Now, it's interesting that we've had three cameras come out recently that are all still 24 megapixels. So the industry clearly thinks it's an absolutely valid sensor size. And they are Sony, the A9 III, Nikon, the Z6 III, and Canon now with the R1. I think at this point in time, when it comes to hardware, we are getting to some physical limits. Also, not only do we get to the physical limits of the hardware, but we kind of get to the limits of what we literally need. Do we need more to put on our TV screens, on our walls, on our computer screens, on our phones? And for the majority of use cases, there is a solid argument that we don't need more megapixels, for example. I don't think we're going to see much more come in these areas. Circling back to these three interesting new features, and this is what I am now starting to call agnostic features. So what we have when we have built-in noise reduction, for example, is does your camera become ISO agnostic? Because it doesn't really matter where you, where you shoot it if whatever ISO, and of course, this is early days and you can't just choose any ISO, I'm sure, you will reach a limit where you can't correct it. But maybe whether you're shooting at 100 or 1600 or 6400, there might not be a very big difference between them. At least that's where it's heading. And then of course we've got the enlargement of files built into the camera. And that means we're kind of resolution agnostic. And we're seeing this happen with pixel shift and we were seeing this happen off camera with things like Topaz. But now to have it in camera, I absolutely think this is the next place that we are going to see all camera manufacturers go using AI and deep learning to solve some of the problems that we have with cameras. Now, perhaps the only other thing that I could probably see happening when it comes to hardware is the idea of what our phones do today, where if you're in low light, they capture lots of frames really quickly. They put them together in camera and basically say, here's your image, even so it might be made up of 20 images. And this is what iPhones do to try and turn these tiny sensors into something meaningful. Now that does require fast sensor readout, and we are seeing some handheld versions of this starting to occur with different systems in a kind of pixel shift sort of mode, uh, but it can now happen handheld. And this is the speed of the sensor coupled with in-body image stabilization. So there's probably still a bit more that can be tweaked from a hardware perspective, but I do think we're gonna see so much more come from a deep learning and AI perspective. And the idea of being resolution agnostic and ISO agnostic as being the next frontier that we might see over the next five years, We've got obviously the Sony A12 will be coming sometime in the next year and a half or so, and probably the Z92 not long after that. If Canon is doing this, I think there's a fairly good chance that we'll see the other manufacturers doing it as well. So I'll say it here again for the first time, this can be a new term that we can send out. Is this the beginning of a new era where we are ISO agnostic and we are resolution agnostic. I certainly think that story is beginning. And with these new AF enhancements, of which there's quite a few in the Canon, but the one that you can actually record a specific face, this kind of, in a way, it makes cameras AF agnostic. There's nothing that you have to try and find anymore because it already knows what it's looking for and it just simply has to appear. So you could all almost do the word gymnastics there that we've now become AF agnostic because the camera's just simply going to do it. Hi, I want to take photos of Mary now. As soon as Mary appears in frame, let's start shooting. That's pretty crazy. And that's basically what's happened here today. This is a very exciting announcement from Canon for the industry as a whole. Congratulations to Canon to getting this gear out. I look forward to sharing more with you as 
I understand more. I'd absolutely love to know your thoughts in the comments below. So please let's have a great conversation below. And if this is your first time here, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. All right, bye for now.